As we've been exploring John's story, we haven't yet come across what actions and personal traits which presented him as the villain and evil king within the public conscience. But that's about to change. John's hunger for power and wealth led him to act rashly and politically stupid, especially with his dealings with the French king, and would become a major problem for King Richard, who already had enough problems during the Third Crusade. For example, illness, raids, shipworms, etc. Yet, despite these problems, King Richard had developed his reputation as a crusader and effective military commander that set his place in history. But at the same time, making enough enemies among his fellow Christians that Richard's return home would become incredibly arduous and John would try and take full advantage of this. In December 1191, John was spending Christmas in Yorkshire. The hot topic of conversation was obviously the Crusade, but in particular, the French king's return from the Crusade. Philip had returned for various reasons, and depending on whose chronicles you read, can be interpreted as Philip reneging on his promise to liberate Jerusalem, or wisely returning due to the state of France or illness. There are numerous reasons as to why Philip returned, although the illness which both he and Richard suffered from sounded horrible. The two kings seemingly suffered from the same disease, referred to as Leonardi or Arnoldia, thought to be trench mal, otherwise Vincent's disease or perhaps scurvy. Philip had a strong fever which caused him to tremble. The disease caused the hair and nails to fall out, the body to swell, lips to become sore, and skin to peel off in strips. Before returning to France, King Philip met with the Pope and received his blessing to break off from the Crusade. King Philip gave the Pope a rundown of what was happening and the difficulties he had working with Richard, with both men arguing over various issues. Although, as we've mentioned, the traits the Angevin king shared, one being a short temper. In one tale, Richard and his men were play-fighting with King Philip's men in Messena, using reed canes in a mock sword fight. Richard fought against William de Bar on horseback. William hit Richard on the head, breaking his headpiece. Richard became incandescent with rage and leapt at William, but failed twice to bring him off his horse. After the fight simmered down, Richard, according to Roger of Howden, shouted, Away with you, Hans, and take care that you never appear in my presence again, for at heart I shall be for everlasting the enemy of you and yours. Now that King Philip was back in France, despite looking bold, lame and neurotic. He wasted no time in undermining King Richard and preparing to strike at the Angevin Empire. Although a risky venture to attack a fellow crusader away fighting for the Christian God, to King Philip, Richard deserved it. On a personal issue Philip had against Richard was his promise to marry his sister Alice Yet Alice was initially a ward under Richard's father, Henry II. She eventually became one of Henry's many mistresses and even bore him a son. So it's understandable why Richard may not have wanted to marry Alice, and he paid Philip handsomely in marks as a form of an apology. But Philip was insulted and added the insult to the list of transgressions from the Angevins, and by January 1192, King Philip was picking a fight with the Normans, and demanded from the Seneschal of Normandy to hand over his sister Alice, and some lands which would have been part of her dowry, a reasonable request. Yet the Normans stated they could not do or act in any way 
without permission from their duke, King Richard. Frustrated by this, King Philip would have normally waged war, but a combination of Richard's developing crusade reputation and the French baron's refusal left King Philip to take a more guile and politically savvy approach, allying with John. John's position in this political game is an interesting one. For starters, he managed to elevate himself into a position of influence and power within England by working against the tyrant, disgraced former Lord Chancellor William Longchamp. John's reputation in England at this point in time was positive. The people of London saw him as the good brother of the king. Yet John didn't have as much power as he would have liked to, as the authority of the kingdom was in the hands of the Archbishop of Rouen, Walter. All John could do was see to the running of his estates and wait for news from the crusade. John was in a state of limbo. He would be king if his brother died, but replaced as heir if Richard had a son, which could be seen as likely as Richard was now married to Berengaria of Navarre. So when John obtained an invitation from King Philip to come to France and marry his sister Alice, along with helping John to usurp Richard from his lands in France, John became filled with enthusiasm and jumped at the chance. However, John's ambition was quickly curbed by his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor had arrived in England by February 1192, and with the Archbishop of Rouen called together several meetings of barons and clergy across parts of England, all to renew oaths of loyalty to King Richard, and in contrast also to John as heir. But John was warned by his mother not to leave England, as if he did, then his estates would be forfeited. John stayed in England, but he didn't sulk. Instead, he turned his attention to fortifying his position in England and gaining more power and leverage. By taking control of two astonishingly important castles in England, Wallingford, a key castle during the Anarchy where Empress Matilda, John's grandmother, held for years, and Windsor, the seat of power for the monarchy, which John's father had greatly rebuilt and reinforced. Remarkably, John managed to acquire and garrison both without any threat of conflict, perhaps through simple persuasion. John had now elevated himself into a more powerful position, with two of the finest castles in all of England under his control. The key players in King Richard's government were fearful of John taking castles, as only the king had the power to grant castles. The situation for the council was precarious. King Richard's authority was paramount and John was challenging it, but at the same time, John was heir, an awkward scenario. Yet worse news was to come with the arrival of the former Lord Chancellor, William Longchamp. He was back with the support of the Pope. After all, he was a papal legate, and he may have paid a bribe to John and Eleanor. The council running England whirled away from their hostilities towards John and begged him to save them from Longchamp, as some were now excommunicated. John must have felt a supreme sense of power, residing at Wallingford. Whoever became the highest bidder would gain John's favour, as John is stated to have said. This Chancellor does not in the least fear the threats or seek the friendship of any or all of you. If he can have only my favour alone, he is to give me seven hundred pounds of silver within the week, if I will not meddle between you and him. You see, I need the money. The council soon enough 
pay John his dues. After all, he had saved the kingdom once again from the tyranny of Longchamp. John was just conducting business as his father and brother had done. Yet even worse news arrived for the council in England and the Angevin Empire as a whole. King Richard had been captured on his return from the Third Crusade, not by the forces of Saladin, but in Austria. Duke Leopold, himself a fellow crusader, held a grudge against Richard. After his capture, Richard was taken into the custody of the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry VI. The imprisonment of a crusader, especially one of the leaders, was the hot news around Europe. And while King Richard was in prison composing top ten hits, his kingdom and lands were charged with raising a huge amount of funds to free their king. After a few years of raising enormous amounts of revenue for the Third Crusade, this is where we will see one of the major black marks on John's reputation, betrayal. John was in a prime position to join forces with King Philip. John controlled a powerful assortment of castles in England, which could hold out for years and had in the case of Wallingford. John learned of his brother's imprisonment at Cardiff in January 1193, and he soon travelled to Normandy with his retinue. Along the way towards Paris, John tried to put forward the case to the lords of Richard's French lands that he should be recognised as their lord. The lords quickly turned John down and reaffirmed their loyalty to Richard. John reached Paris and soon came to an agreement with the French king, performing homage and other diplomatic treaties. John and Philip soon planned an invasion of England by hiring Flemish troops. While in England, John's castles were under siege. The treaty that John had made with the French king was unquestionably stupid and deeply favourable to King Philip, giving him good chunks of Normandy, something John's ancestors had held since Rollo and the Northmen settled there, as well as cities around the Angevin Empire. John had given the French king an easy victory that would have required years of military conflict if Richard was around. And by the end of March, John had managed to arrive safely in England, causing a civil war in the process, and tried to convince potential allies that Richard was dead. He failed, but a peace talk was successfully held by the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Walter. And thanks to his loyal men and his mother, the ransom money for King Richard was raised and Richard was soon to be released. John and Philip soon started to panic. When Richard returned, what horrible fate awaited John. He dared not step foot into England and stayed in France. And by the time the two brothers met again, under the supervision of their mother in 1194, John had only one course of action, prostrate himself and beg for forgiveness, an utter personal humiliation. One source seeks to dramatise the event further, the history of William Marshall, by stating that King Richard said the following after John came whimpering out from another room. John, have no fear. You are a child and you had bad men looking after you. John would spend the next year politically destitute and financially poorer. 